Hey, thank you for coming to the AI track. And I know we don't have a lot of people because this is not really an AI conference, but we do have some interesting talks lined up for you today. And this talk um, is it's not about um, technology projects. It's more about how we do um, open source you know, governance. And so hopefully you'll find it interesting. So um, first of all, um, I want to talk about the organization I represent, Generative AI Commons. And um, as you can see, it's, um, it's a, it's, it is a, a work group under Linux Foundation. And we launched Generative AI Commons last December. Within six months, we have quite a bit of a momentum. And we have over 120 active members from 60 um, organizations. And um, it is open membership, so you don't have to belong to any open source um, Linux Foundation projects, and you can participate. Anybody in the world is welcome. And it doesn't matter if you have AI background or not, because you, know, you can always find a way to contribute um, if you are passionate about this subject. And um, we operate our open source projects um, based on open source and open science principles. And um, our goal is to build generative AI projects um, in a responsible and collaborative way. This is our mission statement. Um, it's long. Um, here, I just want to say quickly, we're dedicated to fostering the democratization, advancement, and adoption of efficient, secure, reliable, and ethical generative AI open source innovations through neutral governance, open, and transparent collaboration and education. So in a nutshell, um, our goal is to um, incubate, grow open source generative AI projects in a responsible and open way. And uh, we foster these projects based on open science, open software, open standards, and open data principles. And uh, we govern this project in an open, neutral governance way. And um, we also have um, people, uh, experts, who are connected to policymakers, helping policymakers understand AI. And um, we also um, cover some education to um, promote generative AI, uh, in responsible AI, and um, so we have uh, course materials um, and webinars, training available. And this is how we are organized today. We have five work streams, and as you can see, each work stream has a focus. Um, models and data work stream, we focus on um, incubating, fostering open source projects about models and data. Application work stream, we focus on generative AI application projects. And frameworks work stream, we focus on um, building reference architecture, um, generative AI adoption. Um, in fact, later today, um, the big part of my presentation is about um, uh, the open framework. Um, and education outreach, education outreach work stream is about you know, creating materials, helping people understand generative AI and responsible AI. And last but not least, responsible AI. It's very important that we build AI in a responsible way and we don't want to cause harm. And um, so we, in this work, we actually study the definition of responsible AI and identify projects that fall into that area. And um, we are also working on responsible framework. I don't know why I'm in and out, in and out. Is, did I wear the map wrong? Um, how about here? No, it's much better. Okay. So five work streams. Um, like I said, we just started uh, this uh, working, you know, uh, community in for like five months, six months. So there's a lot of room that you can, you know, contribute to. So please um, check it out. Um, just go Google search generative AI comments and you will see where, when we meet. Okay, so the topic of today is about, you know, building, uh, fostering responsible AI um, based on open source and community collaboration. So as you know, generative AI is growing fast and furious. And every day, especially where I am, based in Silicon Valley, every day we see new news coming out. Oh yeah, this is this new model coming out. This is new capabilities. And everybody, you know, it's like we're in this fast race. But um, one should really stop and think. You know, somebody said we are actually at the Oppenheimer moment. 
you know, we're excited about the innovation, the technology, but we need to be responsible, we need to be careful, otherwise it can cause harm to humanity. So that's why the subject of responsible AI is very important. And I do think openness is the cornerstone of building responsible AI. And openness can contribute to transparency and accountability. It can help us achieve more actually uh, global collaboration, innovation, ethical development, and in inclusivity. And um, as you can see, this picture is actually generated by AI. It's pretty cool. So my prompt was, give me a vision of you know, generative AI built in a responsible way. And this is the vision. <laughs> OK, so we know open is fashionable. A lot of open you know, um, phrases out there in research papers, in marketing materials as well. You know, you see open knowledge, open access, open model, open source, open data, open science, open community, open standards, open tooling, open collaboration, open hardware, open content, right? There's a lot of open talks out there. So what exactly is open when we say open? And more importantly, is it really open? Okay, so just humor me, play this game with me. And um, think about open in the context of generative AI. Is this open? No. Is this open? Yes. Half open, is it really open? Can you have a half open open source project? Not really. Either you're open source or not open source. Now you get my joke. When Llama is there, is Llama open? Not really. <laughs> when you do a Google, you go to Google, you do a search on open AI. Guess what shows up? ChatGPT, right? But is ChatGPT really open? Not really. ChatGPT is open access, not really open source, according to the OSI definition of open source, which is based on four freedom. You know, the freedom to view, review, freedom to use, freedom to um, analyze, freedom to share. And ChatGPT does not meet all those four criteria. So we are facing this open AI challenge we call open washing. There's a lot of open washing, a lot of vendors, a lot of model producers saying, I'm open, I'm open, I'm open every day. But are they really open? So, so we're gonna have to see. And um, so there's a lot of open washing, especially you have to be careful if you're a model producer or model user, you're gonna have to look at the licenses. What does it say? Even though somebody say, oh yeah, my model is based on Apache too, but if that model, fine tuned model, is based on something that's not a Apache 2 funda um, foundational model, you might have a legal implication there. And, um, or it's not completely open. Somebody said, um, my art open model architecture is open, but my data set is not open, or my training code is not open, then it's not really open. Right? So there, there's a lot of confusion out there in the industry today. And the most important, you see AUPs, acceptable use policies. Right? This is the llama situation. And you can use my open model you know, however you want. Until you are so big, you compete with me. Then you got to pay it up. Then it's not open anymore. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's very complicated there. And you generally, you need lawyers to help you, you know, understand. So as a open source community people, you know, we want open source definition to be strong. It's been there for the last 26 years. It served us very well. And we want to keep, you know, believing open source, the open principle, open, defini uh, open source definition by um, OSI. So, um, okay, before I get into open AI, let's just um, get some understanding of open, you know, certain important concept. The first one is open science. It actually comes from academic world. By the way, who is from the university here today? Oh, no, what, Delft? No? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, a lot of um, research, universities do a lot of scientific research. So, um, open science is not a new concept. A lot of researchers, they embrace open science. So, um, when somebody say they embrace open science, uh, that means you know, the research data dissemination accessible 
and all, uh, to all societies, anybody. So it includes open access, open data, open source, open methodology, open peer review, and open collaboration. So somebody um, did some research. They need to make sure their research is openly available to anyone in the world. And um, they need to open the way they did the research. They need to show the source. They need to show the tools they use. And then they need to welcome open collaboration. So that's the spirit of open science. And the goal is to benefit society as, uh, as a whole. Open source, I kind of mentioned before, and open source has uh, you know, started in 1960 something. And until, and it was just a kind of movement. And t uh, it got formalized um, 26, 26 years ago by OSI. And OSI's definition of open source is, um, you know, anyone can use, study, modify, and share, distribute. Uh, regardless if it's for commercial or non-commercial. And um, so, so this is open source. Like I said earlier, there's no such thing called kind of open source. Either you are open source or you're not open source. If you're open source, you follow the four freedoms um, by OSI. And uh, so when we move to open model, and um, unfortunately today a lot of open models out there are not, not really open source. They are, they are actually source available. So you can get the source code of the model architecture, but still there's a lot of stuff that's missing. Open data. Open data refers to data that's freely available for anyone to access, use, modify, and share. So it's available, uh, it offers uh, availability, it has to be machine readable, reusable, completeness, and timeliness. So generally, when we talk about open data, we're talking about structured data, like databases. So that's why it needs to be machine readable. So it promotes transparency, accountability, and innovation. And when we talk about open model in the context of, um, uh, you know, open data in the context of model, um, and currently the biggest challenge is sharing, you know, data, right? There's a lack of shared data sets and methodologies used to treat and train the data sets. Open content is another form of data. It's actually referring to unstructured content like images, videos, um, et cetera, 3Ds. Um, it, it is generally refers to created works made freely available for anyone to access, use, modify, and share. So it's very similar to, similar to open data. And a lot of open content initiatives are um, started by organizations, communities for you know, promoting um, education, innovation, cultural exchange. And so the biggest issue is about open content in the context of model is um, copyright issues. So you see, you hear a lot of lawsuits out there suing, you know, all those large model producers because they are using, you know, copyrighted content. And um, so that part is, is ongoing conversation. Open access. So there's a difference between open access and open source. Right? Like I said, open source, you need to follow the four principles um, by four freedoms by OSI. And open access is just freely available to use. And you can use it permanent, and you can access it immediately, and you have reuse rights. So there's a difference between open source and open access. And, um, and like I said, the ChatGPT model is more, you know, you, you have access because you can access ChatGPT via API. So it's open access, but it's not open source. So as you can see, the complications out there. So now, finally, we're back to open AI. So what exactly is, does open mean in AI? So we're talking about model and learn parameters. They are readily available, or um, data sets, training data, evaluation data, evaluation code, um, all those things, and also the license that's being used. So. Before we get into that, we still need to have under, we need, still need to understand two concepts: completeness and openness in open science. Completeness is the completeness refers to providing comprehensive, detailed, and well-documented information for all, all components. Just like when you ask your kid, for those of you who are parents, you ask a kid, "Did you finish, did you do your homework?" The kid said, "Yeah, I did." But if you check. There are five, you know, um, problems, math problems. Your kid did only three out of five. Did he finish his homework? No, because he did not complete. So he, has, he must have done all of five. And all those problems, he must have 
put in, you know, intentional effort, not just, you know, some sloppy work, right? So it's the same thing here. When somebody says they are open model, they need to show completeness of their open attempt. Um, and then openness, like I said earlier, it's binary property. It's either you are open, you're, you're based on, you know, OSI, open principles, open full freedoms, or you are not. So it's one or zero, it's binary. It's not like kind of open. Finally, what exactly is openness in AI? It should cover facts, F-A-C-T. Freedom, the ability to use, study, modify, and share based on OSI, um, open freedom. Accessibility, it has to be freely available for anyone. The effort needs to be collaborative, open to anyone, and for contribution or for um, critique uh, reasons, it needs to be totally transparent. That's how, and then you enforce this using open source licenses. So OSI, they have approved, what, 100 open source licenses, and all those licenses follow the four freedoms that they defined. Okay, so license, why do we need software license? Software license, you need that is to, um, to clearly um, define the rights and the responsibilities of software producer, software user, and software distributor. And pre-open AI era, this is you know, what software license covers. It covers software documentations, libraries, and tools. But when it comes to oh, AI, it's a lot more just source code, right? So these are the components of you know, AI life cycle, uh, AI, uh, AI model life cycle. It includes model, includes model parameters, that's bias and weights, evaluations, code, evaluation results, and the data you use for evaluation, um, training data, pre-processing to pre-process the data, and then it needs to include the code for training, validation, and test, and, and inference, and inference, and, um, and then there's the model metadata, there's also data car, model car, research paper, technical report. So these are as comprehensive we can get. There are 16 components in the whole AI model building life cycle. And when somebody says, my AI model is open, so they need to put their word behind their, you know, they, they put their evidence behind their word. And um, so before we get to that, so I just want to show an example of open license versus proprietary restrictive licenses. When we, talk, when we say open source license or open license, we're talking about Apache, all those OSI approved licenses, Apache, MIT, BSD, or CDLA, this is defined by Linux Foundation, is a community data license agreement, or CCBY is the, um, is the, uh, the for the copyright um, co comments, and, and um, propriety restricted license, these are the kind of ones that are newly defined for specific AI models like OpenRail for Bloom, Stable Diffusion uses that, Llama 2 has Llama license, and DB, uh, DBRX, Databricks got their own license, Falcon's got their own license, Google's got their license, and as you can see, <laughs> you, you start to see the trend, right? The AI model producers are creating their own special licenses to meet their own commercial needs. And then they call it open. And if we keep down this path, we're gonna lose our open, the true openness principles. So this is why as a community, we have to work together to support true openness, not wishy-washy openness. Okay, so the solution is um, generative AI comments. This group of this group of people, the community, we came up with a model openness framework, and we actually wrote this white paper. It's published in an archive. A lot of scientific researchers go there, and it's a very good paper. You can you know read. Uh, it's a really good read. You'll learn a lot about you know um, model openness. And these are the six, 16 components I was telling you about. So those model you know uh, producers. And when they say their models are open, they need to put their you know, facts behind their words, right? When they say open, that means we're examining these 16 components and make sure that each component has an open license. And for code, 
we only recognize OSI approved license. For data, we would only recognize CDLA for st uh, structure content, OCCBY um, for, or CC0 for uh, unstructured content, for you know, those um, unstructured content like images and sound and videos. So w we are very thorough. We go to those 16 p components, look at each single one. If one of them is not there, or if one of them is not available, then you question their openness. So we came up, and then we understand, you know, the, if we set the bar too high, nobody can make it, right? And only, probably only scientific research kind of models, yeah, they do, they open. We, actually, we've seen, like, if, if Eleuther AI models, they probably fall into this category. And so it's, you know, as you can see, we, um, you know, we kind of identify three classes. The top class one is the gold standards. That means the AI models is based on the open science principle, which means the data, the source code, the documentation, research, everything is open. And class two is um, everything is open minus the, you know, class one. And then class three is the base model, right? Uh, and um, so that means the architecture is open, parameters, and the final checkpoints, optimizer status open, there's a technical report, evaluation results, model car, data car. So with this, if somebody said, um, I, my model is class three open model, you can pretty much take the source code and then try to you know, start a model, but there's still a lot of information missing. You can't, you know, you might not generate the same as result as the original model creator, right? And, but if you move to class two, if somebody say, I'm class two, MOF class model, it means it provides the training code, inference code, evaluation code, and evaluation data, and uh, libraries and tools, but you still don't have the data set and research paper. So you can kind of understand, but you still don't know everything. I mean, so, so this is why, you know, we are encouraging model producers to all move to class one. So this, um, we call it MOF framework, and it's a way to encourage model producers to move to open science-based open models. And, you know, there's definitely benefit to that. And, um, you know, if you are all the way open science, it means anybody in the world can study, can help you analyze. If you have some situation like, Google's Gemini-ish scandal, right? All of a sudden, somebody, the, the image generator, somebody said, hey, you know, tell me what Washington, you know, President Washington looks like. It becomes like a color person, right? You don't, if, if that kind of situation happens, the whole world can help you analyze what went wrong. Is it the data? Is it the code, right? So the whole world can help you improve. But if it's a black box, then, the model users can, you're at the mercy of the model producer, can you really trust the model? Just like, can you really trust, when you, when you, when you take multivitamins, can you really try, you're like, oh, I'll just take it. But you will want to read. Like, I'm starting to try to read labels, right, what, for the food I eat. Because what you, who you are is what you eat. And... So you, you, you don't want to put poison into your body. So you read the labels. Just like models, you want to read. You want to have total transparency, visibility into what's under the hood. And, and, but in reality, for commercial reasons, sometimes you can't go to open science, you know, because your data could be your differentiation. Or sometimes it could be certain government policies that would not allow you to open your data. In those circum uh, circumstances, it's understandable. You can't go to class one, but you can go to class two. So, so we're not saying, we're not criticizing, saying, oh, class three models are not as good as class one. We're not saying that. But the goal of this MOF is to encourage model producers to move to class one if they can. If they, they cannot, they should have good reasons for their users. Okay, so this is how we implement a MOF. And um, the way we implement that is, you know, well, we have a license, so all the open source projects will have license files. In the license files, you have to be very clear about the, you know, 16 components I just showed you, the license for each component. And then, and then we generate, we have this tool called model openness tool. It's basically just it's a um, script. 
and you will J, uh, produce a MOF J, JSON file. And then, and then that, that tool will run that file and spit out the, you know, a batch that your model is class one, class two, class three. And then we're gonna have some sort of a scoreboard, scoreboard just to show. So the whole point is to give model producers a way to be totally transparent and model users to know exactly what they are getting. So the benefits of model producer, like I said, you have the whole world to help you troubleshoot and improve your model. And then also sometimes for regulation, government compliance reasons, that you get you are offering better transparency and reproducibility. And again, you know, when we talk about responsible AI, reproducibility and transparency are very key to responsible AI. And then this can also help you build a safer AI. And the benefit to model um, model consumer is you know what you're getting, like I said, and then you work with the entire community on your models. So what's out of scope of MOF is bias and fairness, because this is, you know, um, it, w MOF only, um, would only cover openness of the model, and th that is the cornerstone of responsible for AI. But on top of openness, there's still bias, fairness, safety, trustworthiness, performance, red teaming, security, privacy, all those things need to be addressed. So that those uh, areas need to be addressed in separate projects or initiatives. Okay, call to action. This is where you can find the paper. We're still, you know, this is the open source community. So the way we work is bottom up. So we welcome anybody's feedback and um, we're still taking feedback. And then um, get involved. And uh, we're in the process of building this tool. So, so this work is done by the framework work stream of generative AI comments. And then um, also another thing what we're doing is the, uh, the, the model and data uh, work stream, we are currently we're evaluating some of the top models out there and we are looking at the 16 components of each model and then manually label them. Of course, we gotta work with the model producers, but um, for those of you who are interested in participating, come to the work group, um, the work stream, and you'll learn a lot. Like we're gonna study all these you know, top models out there and see what kind of licenses they use, and then we'll label them, of course, with their permission. That is it. Okay, so I'm right on time. I have about like five minutes for questions. Any question? Who's, who work, who's working in the AI space right now? Not many people, so you guys are just here to learn. You know, generative AI comments is a perfect place to learn. And we have um, our, you know, p um, people come from, you know, uh, the members come from um, AI space, also come from open source space. So there's a lot, um, you can definitely pick up a lot of um, knowledge um, in generative AI. So um, um, maybe we should start the next speaker or should we give everybody a break? Maybe next, maybe next speaker. Okay, we can start the next speaker. So next speaker, um, here I'd like to introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is, I'm um, looking at my notes here. We have uh, Wei Lu. Okay, Wei Lu is um, chief consultant at CSDN. Um, he specializes in technical consulting for AI assisted software development, and he has extensive experience in AI. And um, he can, um, he, today he's here to share with us his experience in AI, especially from Asia Pacific. And the topic of his talk today is LLM for coding and state in initiative. Wei, are you ready? Okay. Oh, yours. Thank you.